12. The Word of Flux The infallible word for humanism cannot be an unchanging word. It is an essential aspect of the new faith that the infallible word must be a changing word, the word of flux. This faith was very early formulated in the United States by Octavius Brooks Frothingham, 1822-1895, a champion of the religion of humanity. Frothingham declared, The interior spirit of any age is the spirit of God, and no faith can be living that has that spirit against it. No church can be strong except in that alliance. The life of the time appoints the creed of the time and modifies the establishment of the time. Frothingham held that, first, the true God is humanity, and his spirit is the interior spirit of any age. This means that, like Rousseau's general will, the spirit of the age is the voice of God. Vox populi, vox dei. For Frothingham, humanity is in essence one, and has but one life. This one life is the common pulse of any age, and to be alienated from humanity, to have no share in the common vitality, is death. Second, this common pulse is the infallible will, voice, and word for that age. Thus, for any man, church or state, to disregard that living, infallible word, is death. Third, this infallible word is exclusively a contemporary word, infallible for the present, and no more. Every new moment creates its own creed of the time and reorders life in terms of that infallible spirit of the age. But it cannot bind the future, which has its own voice and creed. Fourth, each new word must modify the establishment of the time Church, state, family, school, and everything else must be changed continuously in terms of this infallible word. In one form or another, this faith confronts us on all sides in the modern age. John Dewey, for example, denied the validity of any faith which accepted a body of intellectual propositions on the authority of revelation from on high, any formal, unchanging creed was for him untenable. Faith, for him, was a tendency toward action. To adhere to any body of doctrine based on an external authority was, for Dewey, a distrust in the power of experience to provide, in its own ongoing movement, the needed principles of belief and action. To look to something external to man and his experience for authority was anathema to Dewey's dogmatic position. Instead, he held, Faith, in its newer sense, signifies that experience itself is the sole ultimate authority. This deification of man's private and collective experiences has led, in our time, to a new dogmatism. Parents, teachers and youth reject any reasoning preaching, or stands which does not give priority to experience. They declare to those who disagree, You don't know anything about life because you haven't experienced this or that. Women declare that no man can condemn abortion because men do not experience childbirth. Homosexuals insist that people who condemn homosexuality have no right to do so until they rid themselves of their hang-ups and undergo the experience without prejudice, that is, favourably. They supposedly have no right to judge. I heard a prominent theologian declare that we could condemn no sin unless we too had experienced it. The standard thus is experience. For Dewey, any faith based on the supernatural was a philosophy of escape, and philosophies of escape have also been philosophies of compensation for the ills and sufferings of the experienced world. 
Dewey's great indictment of the Bible as God's revealed and infallible word is that it is a supernatural word. And the supernatural signifies precisely that which lies beyond experience. Experience is Dewey's yardstick. In terms of experience, he rejects moral codes based on religious supernaturalism. They are, for him, meaningless because they lack the infallible vocabulary of experience. Contrast with such ideas of religious supernaturalism, deeply embedded in all Western culture, gives the philosophy of faith and experience a definite and profound meaning. If your eyes and mind fail to light up in terms of this definite and profound meaning of the philosophy of faith and experience, it is clear that you have not shared Dewey's own religious experience and mystical trust. How is it now possible to put trust in the possibilities of experience itself? Dewey is inviting us to come to the altar of humanistic religion, and his altar call is a simple one. The answer to this question supplies the content of a philosophy of experience. There are traits of present experience which were unknown and unpossessed when the ruling beliefs of the past were developed. Experience now owns as a part of itself scientific methods of discovery and test. It is marked by ability to create techniques and technologies, that is, arts which arrange and utilize all sorts of conditions and energies physical and human. These new possessions give experience and its potentialities a radically new meaning. Today, Dewey's faith in scientific experience is less well received. The anti-technological temper of humanism in the 1970s rejected Dewey's trust in science, but it has by no means altered or dropped his faith in experience as ultimate. It has simply given a primitivistic view to experience and a stressed, raw, unpremeditated experience rather than scientific experience. Dewey's philosophy tended to require this shift. The thrust of Dewey's faith was hostility to any idea of fixity or law outside of man. Change he saw as the essence of experience. Valid experience meant a total commitment to unprincipled change, that is, change ungoverned by any word or standard external to man and his experience. Change was feared, Dewey held, because it was seen as the cause of disorder, chaos and anarchy. One chief reason for the appeal to something beyond experience was the fact that experience is always in such flux that men had to seek stability and peace outside of it. For Dewey, it was wrong to search for the meaning of life and the purpose of the universe. Men who look for a single purport and a single end either frame an idea of them according to their private desires and traditions, or else, not finding any such single unity, give up in despair and conclude that there is no genuine meaning and value in any of life's episodes. This quest for a universe of meaning must be replaced with a purely humanistic and experiential plurality of interconnected meanings and purposes. At this point, an ironic fact takes over in Dewey's thought. Dewey was very much a part of the modern intellectual tradition and its contempt for the bourgeoisie. The term bourgeoisie has become so great a catch-all for liberal and radical anathema and spites that its definition is almost impossible. However, it does mean, in essence, an exploitative middle class, prizing its own experience of freedom and holding a materialistic outlook. Only one aspect of the older bourgeois is missing from this description, its productivity, something detested by the liberal tradition. However, this productivity apart... Nothing more nearly approximates the liberal character of the bourgeois than these intellectuals themselves, their children, John Dewey, and the products of his educational philosophy. We live today in the world of the humanistic bourgeoisie. 
a generation for whom its own experience is ultimate, and for whom self-satisfaction goes hand in hand with a contempt for everything that challenges self-satisfaction. It must be noted that Dewey hoped that experiential man would combine knowledge and social needs with his life of experience. I would suggest that the future of religion is connected with the possibility of developing a faith in the possibilities of human experience and human relationships that will create a vital sense of the solidarity of human interests and inspire action to make that sense a reality. This represents a radically unrealistic hope and a senseless confidence. Having made experience ultimate, how could Dewey expect man who thereby renounced God, to give way to his neighbour. If God cannot take priority over our experience, how can another man? If experience itself is the sole ultimate authority, and men are taught so, how will they then be persuaded to give way to society and the state? Dewey tried to depreciate the individual and his consciousness, He tried to make the true domain of experience the collective experience of the great society. However, having made the individual the new ultimate, he could not then persuade him to surrender his ultimacy to the state, a more jealous God than the God of Scripture. Having made man's experience ultimate, he was asking the new God, man, either to commit suicide or, at the very least, to castrate himself. The results have been very different. According to the old Greek myth, the god Uranus was castrated by his son Cronus. Cronus was later in turn dethroned by his son Zeus. Each god being his own law in Greek humanism, each was in turn subject to overthrow of the next moment in time and its new god, The same is true of the world of John Dewey and of all humanists. Sartre was set aside as the voice of yesterday by the generation he instructed, and Dewey's generation despised the pedestrian and old-fashioned sense of order and responsibility Dewey imbibed from his Christian heritage. When men deify themselves and their experience, they forget that they thereby provide the intellectual apparatus for a newer God to destroy them in the name of flux, in the name of the newer infallible word of the moment, themselves. The result is the perpetual war of the false gods, a war between the generations and a war within the generation.